your question, and that is, uh, why is Jerusalem sacred? And anybody in the audience tell me? Chris, why is Jerusalem sacred? The well, rich and yeah. so mentioned 600 times and more in the, the, not, the Jewish scripture. Okay, it's mentioned 600 times in the Bible, uh, almost as many times as God. But uh, uh, that's not the reason why uh, uh, Jews, Christians, and Muslims uh, venerate uh, Jerusalem and why Jerusalem uh, is, is without doubt uh, the, the issue uh, that is behind all the talks about peace or no peace uh, in Israel, in the Near East, etc. I think one could say, <coughs> uh, starting <coughs> from the latest backward, uh, that uh, Jerusalem is venerated by the Muslims uh, because according to uh, a single passage in the Quran, uh, one memorable night, uh, Muhammad uh, was uh, uh, visited by the angel Gabriel uh, who uh, took him uh, to Jerusalem, uh, not to Mecca, uh, but to Jerusalem, and there uh, there was a waiting for him a uh, white uh, winged horse called, by no coincidence, Barak, uh, who took him uh, to heaven for a one night's visit to heaven where he met angels and all the previous prophets, as the Muslims call them, uh, Jesus and Abraham and Moses, etc. Uh, so Jerusalem is venerated by the Muslims because that is where uh, the angel took Muhammad uh, to be taken from there uh, to heaven. So from uh, Jerusalem, and from a particular spot there in Jerusalem, he went to heaven, uh, wherever ancients and others are there. Uh, and if you then ask, uh, why was he taken to Jerusalem and not to Mecca? Uh, you say, well, you have to go back a little in history uh, because Muhammad uh, in uh, creating a new religion uh, borrowed uh, from uh, the Jews, borrowed from the Christians, and uh, uh, that's uh, the, the, the latest previous one to him. Uh, Jesus uh, was active, the whole story of Jesus, uh, his, his life and his death is uh, connected with Jerusalem. Uh, so, uh, the Muslims' veneration of Jerusalem is linked backward to the Christian uh, veneration of Jerusalem. Uh, so why do Christians venerate Jerusalem? Oh well, of course, because that's where the whole story of uh, Jesus uh, has taken place. Uh, the so-called Last Supper, uh, which was really a celebration of the uh, first night of the Jewish Passover holiday and uh, all the other events that followed uh, took place in Jerusalem. Uh, but why was Jesus in Jerusalem? So we, we go back again and say, well, because uh, as the New Testament says, uh, it was a tradition uh, that uh, the family of Jesus uh, uh, kept, uh, that uh, devout Jews were uh, uh, 
required and were encouraged uh, to make three annual big pilgrimages to Jerusalem, uh, Passover being one of them. Uh, there is even a little uh, vignette in the New Testament that on, on previous such pilgrimages, uh, uh, Jesus, the boy was gone, uh, and because it turned out uh, he was hiding from, from the family because he did not want to go back to Nazareth, so he hid from them. So uh, it was a family tradition uh, to uh, make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and celebrate Passover in, uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, so why was Passover uh, celebrated in Jerusalem? Why were uh, Jews uh, required or uh, encouraged to make uh, three annual pilgrimages to Jerusalem? <laughs> well, uh, because that's where the temple was. Uh, the temple that Solomon built and later on after its first destruction it was rebuilt. And uh, the whole story of the uh, of the, the building of the temple is connected with the exodus from Egypt uh, because the, the temple was supposed to be principally a, a, a housing, a final uh, place of rest for the Ark of the Covenant uh, in which the two tablets uh, with the Ten Commandments were kept. So you go back to the uh, to the story uh, of the temple and uh, and the, the, the Jewish uh, uh, requirement by by God's request and command that uh, that those those uh, uh, tablets of the covenant uh, shall be kept at a specific place on uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, and so the question is, why was that in Jerusalem? And <laughs> as I sit down, I want uh, to start by showing you that uh, if anyone uh, with any uh, knowledge of history, geography, topography, uh, development of civilization, uh, would we ask to, cho to choose a place uh, to, 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 to keep their, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the last place would be where Jerusalem is. Uh, si simply put, Jerusalem uh, should not be normally where it is. So, having answered myself the question, uh, why Jerusalem? Uh, through all those various religions, uh, we will start by uh, finding out that uh, it, it just doesn't make sense for Jerusalem to be uh, where it is uh, if you just read the Bible or follow archaeology, etc. Unless, unless uh, you happen to be one of those uh, who read Sitchin's books and find out that there was a totally different reason for uh, locating Jerusalem uh, where it is. And uh, that's what we are going to talk about. Darkness at noon time. Is that dark enough right now? Mm -hmm. Is that dark enough to start? Uh, you have to uh, advance so I can focus. Uh, well, if uh, the people trust their neighbors, make it darker. 
Okay. Uh, okay. You're gonna need to. Okay. You're gonna need this. Yeah. You want to stand? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so here is uh, the first slide uh, of this afternoon, uh, which shows you a map uh, of the ancient Near East. I'm supposed to have a pointer with me. It's okay. Okay. <coughs> so this is the, the ancient <coughs> Near East, <coughs> uh, which uh, uh, hasn't changed much uh, geographically over this uh, uh, past several thousand years. Uh, <coughs> Uh, this is the Mediterranean Sea, the eastern part of it, uh, which was called the Great Sea uh, at the time, in biblical times. And this is the Persian Gulf, uh, which was called uh, in those days the Lower Sea. This was sometimes also called the Upper Sea, the Lower Sea. <coughs> and uh, the area <coughs> of ancient civilizations and ancient events was really between those uh, two, two seas and this is the, the Red Sea uh, <coughs> which featured in biblical tales. <coughs> uh, as you can see even at a glance uh, that uh, there are hardly any cities, any settlements, anybody living uh, in all this area. Uh, this is today's uh, Arabia, Saudi Arabia. And uh, this is really basically desert, desert lands uh, with uh, hardly any rainfall. <coughs> and these ancient civilizations uh, developed and grew uh, along rivers uh, in this area. Uh, the, the plain, the basin of the Euphrates River and the uh, Tigris River, uh, two of the rivers of, the, uh, of uh, the Garden of Eden, two of the four in the Garden of Eden. And this is where the very first civilization, uh, non-civilization, that of Sumer, uh, developed a little farther north, Babylonia, a little farther north, Assyria, a little farther north, the Hittites, uh, and so on. And this is what's called <clears throat> the Fertile Crescent, because like a crescent, it made half circle. And then down the Mediterranean coast, uh, again, you see settlements. And then there was the Nile civilization, Egypt and Nubia, the Sudan, etc. <coughs> and uh, uh, the trade routes, which I'll show maybe in the second slide. Okay. Okay. <coughs> and the trade routes between uh, the, those civilizations to the east and those to the west and south were along this connecting, the connecting land uh, called Canaan in the Bible, uh, the land of Israel, uh, Palestine in, in, in modern times after the Philistines uh, who occupied this part of the, of the coast. And uh, the trade routes uh, actually followed uh, geo ge geography, and they were really uh, either this way, and once one reached from there here, there were two ways. One was called, in, until Roman times, Via Maris, or the, the way of the sea, following the coastline past the Sinai Peninsula into Egypt, and the other was called the King's Highway, which was on this side 
to the east of the Jordan River, uh, down here. And here, there was really nothing. And <laughs> when I mean nothing, I would... Wrong button. When I mean nothing, I will show you uh, that uh, if you uh, look uh, just uh, a few kilometers outside of Jerusalem, uh, which is here, if you look outside, uh, this is what you see. Uh, you see barren hills. So this is a familiar sight of Jerusalem, the Temple Mount. And then you just see rocks except where somebody came and built a house or a settlement. Otherwise, it's all rock. And one of the problems uh, of Jerusalem, as of uh, the whole of uh, the land of Canaan, uh, was the question of uh, uh, the shortage of water. Uh, <coughs> there was total dependence just uh, on rainfall. Uh, since there was no major river, the, the <laughs> hallowed uh, Jordan River uh, isn't uh, uh, much more than, than a brook, and uh, especially in uh, these days. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the, 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 the struggle uh, to supply that place uh, with water uh, was a, a continuous one. Uh, I have chosen this slide to show you an aerial view. Uh, this is the Temple Mount, uh, this whole area of the Temple Mount, uh, with the walls that if you visit Jerusalem you can follow them uh, this way. And this is the old city. And uh, again where the people came and built uh, their, their houses, but when you uh, just leave, leave the built-up area. Again, all you see uh, is rocks. Uh, an interesting aspect of this aerial view, uh, uh, for which uh, I don't offer a, a specific explanation, but uh, <clears throat> there, are, there, there must be some explanation, and that is in this area of the Temple Mount, which is one large man-made platform. Uh, there are a lot of underground cisterns to collect rainfall. And therefore, you see, this is a verdant section. But somehow, on a more ancient platform, upon this platform, not a single tree or bush grows. Uh, for whatever reason, is uh, uh, for one to uh, just speculate or use imagination. <laughs> now, uh, uh, if you uh, uh, go to the old city when uh, you say Jerusalem, Jerusalem, why is Jerusalem important or central, uh, you're really talking not about the new quarters here or uh, some uh, Arab villages here, uh, so-called East Jerusalem, you're talking about the old city, the old city. And uh, this, this is how it is uh, more or less uh, uh, stay divided in the last uh, uh, centuries, uh, even after the British captured Jerusalem from the Turks in 1918. Uh, so there is uh, the Temple Mount, and then there are the various quarters, the Christian Quarter, uh, the Muslim Quarter, the Armenian Quarter, the Jewish Quarter, uh, and so on. And uh, <clears throat> if you uh, compare today's, more or less, today's Jerusalem, or central Jerusalem, uh, to a previous one, and this one is uh, how Jerusalem looked uh, in Roman times, which is the time of, of Jesus. Uh, you see again that it's basically the same thing. There is the Temple Mount, and from it there grew various suburbs or more later settlements, uh, getting different names. 
in the Roman times during the Jewish revolt against the Romans. This was called the upper city, and this was called the lower city. Uh, and uh, in terms of antiquity, uh, besides the Temple Mount, uh, this was the most ancient area, and this was then added, and this was added, and this was added, and then this was added, and then so on. <coughs> uh, and, and now, this I'm going back, and uh, now to the time of the uh, kings, kings of Judea, uh, David, Solomon, uh, this particular one is from the time of a king called Hezekiah, uh, <coughs> where again you see the basics of the city, uh, the oldest part, the newer part, uh, and then the newer part in those days, this is around 1000 BC. And then this one, which I chose this uh, um, map in particular, because it indicates the, uh, the, the tunnel uh, leading from the spring of Siloam uh, to, uh, uh, to, to the, uh, the central collecting point in Jerusalem. Now this was already a city wall in the time of the uh, Jewish Hebrew Judean kings. And the great thing was that the main source of water for Jerusalem, uh, apart from collecting uh, rainwater, was this spring. And it was outside of the city walls. So when according to uh, uh, the story in the Bible in the book of Kings, and when uh, the, the danger of an Assyrian uh, invasion of Judea uh, was uh, looming, uh, Hezekiah ordered uh, the construction, which was at that time a, a tremendous engineering feat, of an underground tunnel, hidden tunnel, that le led from the spring outside the city walls and wound its way into the city within the city walls. And this is uh, the route of the, uh, of the tunnel, Hezekiah's tunnel, uh, from uh, outside the city uh, into the city. And as you see, it wound not only its way, wound its way not only geographically or topographically, but at some point here, uh, it seems to be a kind of a diversion. And with this comes a very interesting biblical story, uh, because in order to speed up the construction of the tunnel, uh, as the invasion by the Assyrian the king was, was looming, uh, the construction started from both ends. There were uh, uh, tun tunnel uh, diggers, if that's the word, uh, who started this way and others who started that way. And the problem became, when they were both around midway, uh, where, where to be it? How should the ends meet? Um, there is an actual inscription that was found on the walls of the tunnel uh, at that spot, at that spot, <coughs> that uh, describes how the diggers uh, from both ends one day heard the, the hammering or the, uh, <coughs> the digging uh, from, from one end uh, of, they had the, 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 the hammering of those from the other side and uh, knew how to uh, dig towards each other and meet. So this inscription was on the uh, walls of the tunnel uh, in uh, a beautiful royal Hebrew script from that time, around 1000 BC. Uh, and the reason it is shown like that is because when it was discovered uh, sometime in the mid 19th century and uh, the, 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 the land, Jerusalem, were under Turkish uh, control, <coughs> uh, the, the Turkish authorities 
or that the inscription uh, cut out of the walls of the tunnel, uh, of course not without damaging it, and brought it to the museum in Istanbul. So uh, the interesting thing about this is not only uh, this is a literal physical <coughs> evidence conf confirming uh, the biblical tale, but uh, there are uh, other documents supporting uh, the veracity of the Bible. One is uh, uh, an, uh, an Assyrian uh, stela, uh, that's not <laughs> the stela, <coughs> an Assyrian stela uh, by, by, by the king Sanherib, uh, who describes his siege of Jerusalem, and the stela is now in the British Museum. The inscription is in the museum in Istanbul in Turkey, and the tunnel is in Jerusalem. And those who have traveled with me on some of my uh, so-called Earth Chronicles expeditions uh, have been, if they went on all my trips, uh, have been to all three places. We, we went through the tunnel in Jerusalem, uh, we were in Istanbul, and, uh, and the museum and opened, opened that floor for me. Uh, to, to show me and my group the inscription, and we saw the inscription of St. Herib in, um, in London. So, um, uh, what was it there, as uh, we keep seeing each time, uh, that any time, any plan you look at of Jerusalem, uh, this seems to be there all the time. And this Temple Mount, which, as I said, is a, a large, large platform, and this is about uh, uh, 15, 15 to 2,000 feet long by about uh, 500 or so wide, so it's quite a large paved platform. Uh, this seems to be there all the time. Now. And the first one uh, to uh, settle and to uh, choose Jerusalem um, as the capital uh, and move it from, from Hebron uh, to Jerusalem uh, was King David. And uh, the Bible uh, tells the story of how King David, having been told by God uh, that uh, it's time, it's time to build uh, a permanent housing uh, for the Ark of the Covenant, uh, told him where it should be, and uh, told him it should be on that mount uh, where this platform uh, existed already in the time of David, uh, before uh, he even uh, moved to Jerusalem. And the Bible refers to, to the place as the threshing, threshing um, place of, I um, um, think, uh, not, not Uriah, but uh, I forget the, the exact name, a, a Jeb Jebusite uh, a landowner uh, who owned the place as a, um, as the, as a place where the wheat, wheat was separated uh, from the <coughs> stalks uh, and through threshing as illustrated uh, in this uh, uh, depiction. And uh, when uh, David came to uh, this uh, Jebusite uh, owner and said, uh, <coughs> uh, I, I need a place, uh, because I'm commanded by God uh, uh, to build there a, um, a house for the Lord. <coughs> uh, the uh, Jebusite said, uh, fine, fine, it's fine with me. Now, uh, which, which corner, which specific uh, part of, of the threshing floor do you, do you need? And, and I'll let you use it. And David said, no, no, I, 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 I need, I need, and my people need to own it. We need to, to have permanent, forever, 
ownership of this place and after some negotiation David paid 600 gold shekels. Now the currency at the time uh, was a shekel which was a certain weight of silver and uh, when normally when, when the term shekel was used as the price or the amount paid for something it always meant a silver shekel and here uh, the payment was uh, in gold gold shekels uh, which was 600 gold shekels at the time was probably uh, at least uh, what a trillion euros I mean <laughs> which which currency should we quote these days so um, and, and David purchased the place <coughs> However, um, once he did, uh, uh, a prophet called Nathan at the time came to him and said, I have uh, bad news for you uh, because uh, you, you have done uh, certain things uh, which are not to the liking of uh, the Lord. Uh, you, you spilled a lot of blood in your wars and therefore your, the temple uh, which you have started uh, to uh, uh, find a place for it, etc., uh, will be built not by you, but by your son Solomon. And this is uh, the, the ground plan, at least, of the uh, Temple of Solomon, or sometimes called the First Temple in Jerusalem, uh, which uh, consisted of uh, three parts, uh, an entrance, uh, a foyer if you want to call it, a central uh, hall for worship and uh, behind a screen, a veil uh, of cloth, not of metal, not of wood and not of stone but of cloth, there was the Holy of Holies <laughs> where the Ark of the Covenant uh, which was made of wood uh, <coughs> covered with gold, inlaid with gold inside and out, uh, and <coughs> uh, on top of which there were two cherubim, uh, presumed to be uh, winged beings, like winged angels, uh, which uh, one could see in Egypt or in Assyria, <coughs> but uh, uh, we don't really know. Uh, exactly how they looked, so I didn't uh, want to include a, a picture uh, as if that's it, so. <laughs> but, uh, and, and the, the, the whole device, uh, this uh, a chest uh, or ark inlaid uh, with gold inside and out, um, which, which, which could uh, uh, be a transmitter, actually was called a dvir, uh, which literally translated from Hebrew means the speaker because that was the device uh, through which uh, God uh, spoke with Moses uh, in the desert <coughs> during the Exodus. <coughs> so this was the plan of the um, uh, first temple, the Temple of Solomon and the most important part was this Holy of Holies. Now uh, uh, we, we jump through the ages, uh, there was, uh, as I showed you, the Roman period of when Jesus uh, was, <coughs> then there was the Byzantine Christian period, and around the, in, <coughs> in the middle 7th century AD, we are now into AD, uh, the Muslims coming out of Arabia uh, started to, to seize the lands, they seized the, the Near East, they seized uh, the parts of North Africa, <coughs> they seized the parts of Europe uh, in the Balkans, <coughs> they seized the eventually parts of Spain. Uh, so um, there was quite a, a Muslim thrust <coughs> uh, starting in the 7th century uh, from from the ancient Near East, from, from what we call today the Middle East into uh, Asia, Africa, 
and Europe at both ends, Spain on the one side, and <coughs> Turkey, um, Albania uh, on the other side. <coughs> and uh, this is how uh, Jerusalem looked uh, <coughs> during the Muslim or Mohammedan uh, period that lasted from about 650 in round numbers, uh, 650 AD, to the collapse of the Ottoman Turkish Empire in uh, 1918, when the British captured uh, Palestine. Uh, so you, you, you deal with uh, uh, <coughs> more, more than seven, seven centuries, and during which time uh, Jerusalem remained more or less the way it was uh, centuries before, <clears throat> and Jerusalem <clears throat> was never, never a, not only a capital of any of the Muslim caliphates or, or other uh, political or royal entities, uh, it was not even an administrative center, and the administrative center uh, for the land that's called by the uh, Arabs now Palestine <coughs> was uh, Damascus in Syria, <coughs> and uh, the the local the local um, administrative uh, regional regional center was in a, in a town called Ramla, not Ramallah but Ramla, <coughs> which is uh, a few miles away. Uh, from from the coast that uh, where Jaffa is today, so Jerusalem was totally uh, neglected. Uh, was of no particular consequence uh, to the Muslims for the uh, seven or whatever centuries uh, uh, they were in control of it. <coughs> and as a matter of fact, at the time of the. Uh, British capture of Jerusalem in 1918, where a census was taken of the population of Jerusalem. Uh, the total population was about 75,000, <coughs> of whom 65% um, were Jews. Uh, the total Muslim population out of that was 12,000, and the rest were Christians. So, um, uh, historically, uh, there is absolutely no connection between the Muslim world and the Muslim religion uh, with, with Jerusalem, except that one night trip by Muhammad to, um, uh, to heaven. Uh, nevertheless, <coughs> that, that, that uh, one night, and where it uh, started from uh, seemed uh, important because uh, the first uh, caliph ruler, Muslim ruler, uh, from um, uh, what is now uh, Damascus, uh, <coughs> decided to build a housing, a housing, a building around the rock which was the heart of the Holy of Holies in Solomon's temple. <clears throat> so the structure is called, the way it functions, the Dome of the Rock, because there is a dome that <clears throat> distinguishes the site and all the pictures you ever see of Jerusalem uh, because of the dome. And the dome uh, is a gilded, it's not made of gold, but it's gilded. And the interesting thing is, and you'll uh, soon hear from me why, the interesting thing is that the dome, the dome, which is not a typical Muslim uh, uh, roofing, <coughs> was brought over uh, from a place in Lebanon by the caliph who, who uh, who reigned from Damascus by the Caliph from a place in Lebanon called Baalbek. And there, 
a place that was revered from antiquity. Um, uh, in earlier times and followed by the Greeks and followed by the Romans and followed by the Byzantines and followed by the Muslims, etc. Everybody came and built their house of worship, a church, a mosque, whatever, um, on that place in, in Baalbek. And uh, the Caliph just took the dome and it was the covering or ceiling of the Byzantine church at Baalbek and moved it and used it in Jerusalem. So this is the story of the Dome of the Rock, which is the dominant structure as you look at pictures of Jerusalem. And this is a close-up of the, of the gilded, uh, gilded Dome. <coughs> if you uh, I want to know exactly the location. Uh, by the way, in my book, uh, uh, The Earth Chronicles Expeditions, of which I have a copy here, uh, but it's dark so you can't see it. But they, David may have uh, some extra copies. I write, I write about uh, Jerusalem, I write about uh, some of the things I'm going to tell you about. And I have this uh, map uh, <coughs> that I prepared for the book, and it shows that the Dome of the Rock uh, is exactly located over the area where the Holy of Holies, you remember the tripartite architecture of the Temple of Solomon, and this was the Holy of Holies, and the Dome of the Rock is uh, built precisely over uh, the, that spot. Uh, this is our uh, look from above, from the ceiling, down to the rock, to the rock on which the Art Covenant stood. And this is uh, the very ornate ceiling inside. Uh, this whole thing is very decorative, and uh, <clears throat> and this is a diagram that shows more precisely. Um, I wouldn't uh, go into the details; it's in my book. But uh, this is again shows uh, the rock and how how this structure uh, <coughs> precisely covers it. <coughs> and now. Uh, uh, travelers uh, in the 18th, but mainly in the 19th century, where when access was a little easier uh, to um, the Temple Mount than uh, at other times under Muslim control, always I found out depicted that uh, where this is where the rock is, they depicted a cave a cave under the rock. A cave, and sometimes two caves, one below the other. And this was so predominant, and I <laughs> went over, I don't know how many, but any, any source I could find of, of a map, a sketch from 18th and 19th century travelers always showed at least one, at least one, and sometimes two caves under the rock. This is the rock, and these are the caves. <coughs> I was especially fascinated <coughs> when I came across this woodcut um, that shows that there were actually stairs leading from um, the floor area above there where the rock uh, where the rock is stairs leading down uh, and the walls are covered with carpets and somebody is praying or whatever <coughs> now <coughs> this whole thing intrigued me <coughs> because one of the mysteries surrounding uh, the 
the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant, is that at some point <coughs> the Ark of the Covenant disappeared. Uh, <clears throat> there is a whole story, uh, likely or not, I don't know, <clears throat> that uh, uh, says that uh, when the Queen of Sheba visited Solomon, uh, and they had some hanky-panky, uh, so a son was born, and the son who was born when the Queen of Sheba already was back in her land, <clears throat> went back to Jerusalem, and uh, unable to claim uh, a kingship in Jerusalem, uh, he uh, at least uh, decided to have some important relic from Jerusalem, and he stole uh, the Ark of the Covenant and took it back to Ethiopia. Uh, the tradition in Ethiopia at that time was used to be called Abyssinia, it was that uh, the, the uh, Ethiopian kings, though they were uh, converted to Christianity, were really all uh, descendants uh, uh, from the line of, of Solomon. And uh, the, during World War II, <coughs> the, uh, uh, the Ethiopian king uh, was in exile in Jerusalem uh, because the Italians captured Abyssinia. Uh, called uh, one of his titles was the Lion of Jude Judea. Now, uh, uh, this is a, an unlikely story because uh, the Queen of Sheba came from Sheba, which was in, in, in Arabia and not in Africa. So, um, uh, but anyway, uh, some, some have written about it and uh, it's a fascinating tale. There is some uh, uh, underground uh, church cut into the rock at some place in Abyssinia where the ark supposedly uh, is seen, but only by, by the high priest of the, of, of the Ethiopians. So. <coughs> but uh, according to, to the, the best information provided by the Bible itself, <coughs> there is a verse in the Bible that says that uh, when Jerusalem started to be invaded by the Babylonians, uh, we eventually captured it and eventually destroyed the temple. Uh, the, the, uh, the priest hid the Ark of the Covenant, and the words in Hebrew are, in its place. And I just wondered, seeing all these double caves and all this thing, whether in its place means that it was taken from uh, above, down one cave, and maybe a second cave. <clears throat> so on one of my uh, uh, trips to Jerusalem, uh, it took a lot of doing. Uh, I tried to, to do it uh, uh, officially through some contacts with, with the Muslim authorities, that are in control of the place. Uh, and, and, and they said, well, it'll take weeks until I might get approval. And then uh, one, one of the aides there in the office, the, the, the wife, the, the, the authority, the, the, the authority that keeps control of, of Muslim shrines, and one of the guys came to me and uh, said, uh, if you want, if you can come back tomorrow with some money, I'll let you in. <laughs> so, um, so I came back <laughs> the next day with some money, and he let me in. And as a matter of fact, I took with me uh, some of uh, uh, those who traveled me, uh, I, I, like later on, Chris, to, uh, to, to be recognized. Uh, Eric traveled with me, uh, uh, who else here, I don't know, uh, uh, David, well, David, of course. <laughs> so uh, I actually came back the next morning with Wally, who uh, was like a mission photographer, and he was able to, to photograph things that nobody was supposed to photograph. 
and he stood guard up there to warn me if somebody comes, and I actually went down. I went down those stairs up to here, and uh, I could not determine if there is an opening to, to an, a lower cave, uh, because everything was covered with carpets, the way it's here. And what I wanted to see is how large is the opening, because the Bible gives the exact measurements of the Ark of the Covenant, and I wanted to, to figure out if the opening, if it exists, if it is wide enough for the priest to have uh, uh, hidden, hidden the Ark there. Uh, so um, I, I, I did not uh, succeed fully in, in that mission. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned, the, <clears throat> the, uh, the platform, all uh, a stone platform, <clears throat> has uh, many cisterns uh, to, to, to collect water, rainwater, <clears throat> but it also has uh, various subterranean tunnels uh, that form like secret entrances or secret ways either to enter or to escape from whoever will uh, besiege uh, the Temple Mount. Uh, so there's this one, and there's this of particular interest, this one, which is closest to where the Holy of Holies was, and the question unresolved uh, is whether if this was uh, the, the, the rock on which the ark stood, if there are actually two cavities, two caverns down, uh, is there somewhere a connection to this point here, so that because this one can lead out and serve as a, an escape. Now, this is uh, the western retaining wall. This whole Temple Mount is surrounded by a retaining wall, uh, some of it from uh, uh, Roman or the, the time of Jesus, which is the second temple, and some going back uh, to the very beginning of this whole uh, uh, structure here. And uh, the interesting part is that the lower, the lower you go, the more ancient and the more colossal the structures are. So this little portion, this little portion here of the western wall uh, <coughs> is, was until Israel <coughs> Uh, re re recaptured Jerusalem, uh, the, East, the, the old city, from the Jordanians uh, who, who controlled the area. Uh, until then, the whole access to the famed Western Wall, or as uh, <coughs> it sometimes was called, the Wailing Wall, uh, because uh, Jews for centuries have uh, come here uh, to uh, to wail, to bewail, to cry, uh, uh, the, the bewail and the decry, uh, the destruction of the temple. Uh, so this, believe it or not, was the whole wall that was visible for centuries, this part, for centuries, from the western wall, which was much larger, and from the whole temple compound, and from the temple mount, and from the remains of the temple, and from the Holy of Holies, and from the, and from the sacred stone, etc. This was the only part where Jews for centuries could come and bewail uh, the destruction of the temple. <coughs> on, on a personal note, I can uh, uh, tell you uh, uh, an anecdote, a personal experience, and that is that uh, uh, the, the access to this, even under the so-called enlightened uh, British rule, 
uh, from uh, 1917 until uh, they left in 1947 and um, Israel was established except that this was uh, uh, under Jordanian control until 1967. So under the British uh, rule, the Jews were allowed to come and pray. They were allowed to come and bewail, uh, but they were not allowed to sound the shofar, the ram's horn at the end of the most holy day, which is the Day of Atonement. And it was <laughs> a catch if me if you can game of uh, young Isra Jews at the time, there was no Israel yet, uh, to congregate and fill up this area with, with as many people as could uh, squeeze in and at least one of them had with him a ram's horn and the British were frantically searching and searching and each end of the Day of Atonement <laughs> the ram's horn was sounded <laughs> and uh, I was there a few times in the crowd that uh, defied the British. So when Israel uh, recaptured the Holy City, uh, the, one of the first thing, the things that were done was to the, remove all the buildings that over the centuries were encroaching and encroaching and encroaching ever closer to uh, to the remains of the first temple uh, and they created a plaza and revealed a much larger uh, section of the wall uh, which if you look at this uh, aerial photograph uh, that little part used, uh, they used to be the, uh, the, the, the so-called wailing wall and uh, that whole thing that whole part was cleared, except that the encroaching buildings here were not removed. Now, uh, this aerial shot is interesting uh, for another reason, and if you remember the uh, <coughs> maps of uh, ancient Jerusalem that I showed you under uh, this time, and the Judean time, and the Roman time, etc., etc., uh, so you always see the Temple Mount high above, higher than, than its surroundings. And then you see here a slope, a slope. And that is, if you remember, the oldest part called the City of David. So when David was told uh, to buy the threshing floor, uh, to build uh, the house of the Lord, uh, he already had his capital uh, in Jerusalem, but not on the Temple Mount. There was no temple yet either. Uh, down here, so the question that one must ask himself is <coughs> if uh, this was owned by a Jebusite or like a Canaanite a landowner or, or, or farm holder who just used this as a threshing floor. Nothing else was built here at the time. And David moved his capital from Hebron, which is further south, uh, to here. And this is the set city of David. And this is all sloping down and sloping down. Who builds his capital at the lowest point of a place and not at the highest point of a place? The, does this make sense? So whenever I started to look at the topography of Jerusalem, uh, this always was a question that I couldn't find any uh, an answer to it in any in any textbook. No, no, nobody 
add an explanation for me. Why would a uh, king who was a, uh, a great military tactician, uh, who defeated uh, almost everybody else, uh, whose, whose realm extended almost to, to Damascus in Syria and across the, the, the Jordan to, to what is today's Amman, uh, why would he choose <laughs> the lowest place in the area uh, to build a city and not the topmost place? <clears throat> An interesting part answer uh, came, came to me, came to my mind, was because this particular section here had a name. Um, <clears throat> And one name was called the Ophel in the Bible, in Hebrew, the Ophel, and the other was uh, Milo. And the Ophel means the place or the area used for going up, and Milo meant the filling, the filled up area. So, in fact, <coughs> archaeologists in recent years <coughs> have been digging here, digging here, digging here, uh, have found out that this area was actually artificially served as a platform, as a way up. Somebody filled up the, 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 the valley-like portion here to connect the city of David to the place where eventually the uh, temple was built. So this whole thing was known, was deliberate, etc. And the only reason that I could find, and I'm back to, to my own theories, is that uh, the reason that David could build his capital here and not here, because this was an area sacred to God and not for people to live on. Uh, so he chose it here he filled up this area and the below and or the awful the, the 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 climbing up place in order to be able to reach the elevated uh, platform and so this gives you the shot here of the western wall and also explains <coughs> some other enigmas connected uh, with jerusalem uh, I'll go back a minute. <coughs> now, uh, I, I mentioned that <coughs> as uh, archaeologists were, were able, uh, especially under Israeli control, to, to start excavating uh, all around here. Uh, so let's say in this corner, the southwest corner of the retaining wall of the platform, <coughs> I, I mentioned that the lower and to the more ancient sections you go, the bigger and more massive are the stones. So here is a sketch, a photograph and a sketch. This is a photo, this is a sketch. So when you visit or when you have the aerial photographs, this is the part you see. This is the part that was somewhere a little more here, the, the Wailing Wall. And you see how many more courses went down, more ancient, and you see how bigger, how bigger the stone blocks became the more you went down. And this is even more prominent when you go to this end of the wall, as it was uh, extended, and the, 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 the plaza in front of it extended, and you go to this part, not here, which I showed you before, but you go here. Now, these buildings here were not destroyed for whatever reason, too many of them or whatever, <laughs> but there is a way to go in uh, which uh, was uh, opened with great uh, uh, physical, archaeological, and political difficulty. 
and this is uh, where you are. If you enter, if you enter that area, uh, which I showed you, you are about here, and then you go some steps down, and then there is another level below it, and then there is another level below it, and the same story that the lower you go, <laughs> the older and the more massive the structures are. <clears throat> As you go uh, okay. As if you go in here and continue all the way until the exit, it is called the archaeological tunnel. <clears throat> As you go there and you start to walk not on this level, but on that level. <clears throat> you pass by some very interesting spots. On one spot, there is a sign and it says, uh, uh, if I can read it, this point is located opposite the foundation stone, which is the site of the Holy of Holies. So, without Going back with all the slides, you remember uh, the, what I showed you, the actual, and I wondered whether there is a connection if you go to one lower cave and one other cave, whether there's a connection, and according to this, uh, there is, or there was. <clears throat> another spot uh, is another one further north along the wall, <coughs> which uh, it says that it was a, a secret passage. Uh, again, maybe it was used, maybe it was not used by the priests to uh, hide or smuggle out the um, Ark of the Covenant. <coughs> now along that uh, <coughs> uh, tunnel, it's, it's tunnel simply because there are those other buildings that were not removed, <coughs> but this was uh, open area in antiquity, at the time of the first temple, you come across some colossal stone blocks that are not ground level, which continues further down and down. <coughs> so these are stone blocks. Uh, the, the, the area is too narrow to, to capture the, the, the size of them, and I tried it in different ways. Uh, this is uh, uh, the group uh, that was with me. <coughs> and they all wore uh, white heads so that we would recognize them in the crowd, except I, me, I wore a blue one, uh, being the captain. <laughs> uh, <coughs> and uh, I don't know uh, if David will recognize himself here or uh, Chris, but uh, anyway. So this is a colossal stone block, and this is another shot of it. Uh, it starts there, and it continues, and couldn't, couldn't get the, the end of it. And these uh, stone blocks uh, weigh about 600 tons each. Now, um, in case you wonder uh, what it means, 600 tons stone block, the, the largest, <coughs> the largest <coughs> single stone block in the Great Pyramid of Giza is 25 tons. And so this is at least 40 times more. Uh, I sometimes used when, when Cadillacs were, were Cadillacs, I said it's like piling up um, 300 Cadillacs on top of each other and quarrying it somewhere and then trying to bring it over here and lift it and put it on top of other courses because this goes down and down and down as I've shown you. <coughs> um, again, you, you, you know, you can guess my explanation <coughs> who could uh, carve and quarry and lift and place uh, such uh, colossal stone blocks but um, uh, sane archaeologists, not, not nuts like me, sane archaeologists, of course, try 
to explain it somehow. Now this illustration is from a most recent book on the subject, an expensive book by, 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 by highly regarded archaeologists uh, who show you how simple it was uh, to move the stone blocks. You quarry them, you put them on a cart, and you brought them to where they should be. <laughs> and and two, two uh, uh, not mules, you know, two bulls would, would, would do that. No problem. And in case you say, well, but it was it's still a problem. Uh, well, so then say, yeah, but these people were ingenious. So they used the stone block as the axle. You see, they took a stone block and they built the wheel around it. And that's how they rolled it to the place. You see, even one gives them instructions. A little higher, a little higher. <laughs> so. Okay. Now, so, now, to, to, to sum it all up, <clears throat> we now uh, are uh, realizing that uh, there existed a vast stone platform by the time David came there. Indeed, by the time Abraham came there, because the first time Jerusalem, as Ir Shalem, from which Jerusalem comes, Ir Shalem, the city of Shalem, already existed at the time of Abraham, because when in, in, in the Bible, in Genesis 14, <coughs> there is a story of an international war, of an invasion of, uh, let's call it Canaan, uh, by, by, by kings, an alliance of kings from the east, and Abraham was involved in uh, defending uh, what I say was the spaceport in the Sinai Peninsula. Um, and when, when, when the whole thing was over, uh, in recognition of, of uh, his saving captives, including his uh, nephew Lot, uh, and, and, and then recouping the, the, um, the booty and so on, uh, he stopped, he made a stop at uh, the city of Shalem, Ir Shalem, and uh, the, the king who was the high priest, and it, it clearly says the high priest of the El Elyon, of the God Most High, uh, in his name blessed Abraham, and Abraham uh, was offered uh, to, to keep some of the booty. He said, I, I, I will not do that. I, I did not do it for, for this kind of reward. Uh, it refers to, uh, to the God Most High as, as Yahweh, uh, Jehovah. And um, so that was already at the time of Abraham, uh, at least a thousand years before uh, the time of David. So there was already uh, a sac sacredness to this place. Uh, so here you have this vast platform. Uh, here you have this city of David below with the filling leading up. Uh, this is a, uh, a cut of it. <coughs> and uh, if you uh, try to calculate <coughs> the uh, uh, work involved the quantity, the quantity of uh, earth moving and stones and stone blocks and others to fill up and create a, a level stone platform was a huge, a huge uh, undertaking, <coughs> which obviously uh, was beyond uh, the ability of uh, two guys with the car. <coughs> <coughs> And uh, uh, the only, only similar place, but much, much more impressive and more and bigger uh, than that, is a place called uh, Baalbek in Lebanon, which probably not by coincidence, uh, the caliph 
uh, borrowed <coughs> the gilded dome from there, uh, the Christian one, the Byzantine one, and used it uh, to uh, uh, use a dome as a ceiling uh, for the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. And this place is uh, called Baalbek uh, in Lebanon, uh, which I visited again with, uh, with uh, uh, one of my groups. <coughs> and uh, it is referred to, if you drive there, on the way, uh, there are signs saying with arrows uh, to the Roman ruins. <coughs> Roman ruins because the, the, the last ones uh, to build their temples there after they removed the previous religious temples were the Romans. And there is a, was a series of temples, uh, the largest of which was to uh, uh, Jupiter. And this temple to Jupiter right here was the largest one uh, in the Roman Empire, larger than any temple to Jupiter, even in Rome itself. And what you see there, if you visit it, is that this place again, like the one in Jerusalem, is that uh, is built layer upon layer upon layer of stone blocks that are more colossal the lower and the more ancient times you go to. <coughs> uh, <coughs> the place is a stone platform of uh, half a million square feet. Parts of it are encroached by now by buildings, by modern residences. Uh, but this is uh, at this uh, northwestern corner uh, was this temple to Jupiter uh, leading from uh, very, very complex and very uh, impressive, I must tell you, uh, structure even after 2,000 years, what remains of it uh, to this. So uh, this particular northwestern corner uh, is the one that uh, draws the most attention <clears throat> because as you start to climbing up and going west, you climb from there, 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 the west, <clears throat> you start meeting these stone blocks that start with uh, down there with blocks that are about 600 tons each, which is the same size as you have in Jerusalem. And then these are about 900 tons each. And then you reach a place, <laughs> and the western wall, where three colossal stone blocks, known as the triliton, lie or were placed side by side, one, two, and there's a third one, over these ones. And these weigh 1,100 tons each. Now, there's no, <laughs> no equipment today that can lift 1,100 tons or, or even uh, 900 tons or even 600 tons or whatever. Uh, just to, to give you an idea of the comparison, you, you see the midget there? The major there. That's me. Yeah, I'm the major there. So this is a, a colossal play. That's not me. Uh, it's a, you, you see the colossal. So, so you see one, two, three stone blocks like that. Now, as it happens, we know where they were quarried because one of those colossal stone blocks was quarried about uh, a mile and a half, two miles away from the so-called ruins in, down in a valley. Uh, the quarrying of it was not completed. This part still sticks in the ground. And if you want to know how large it is, that's how large it is.
So, at some time in the past, someone quoted it here, precisely, you see, they are precisely cut, lifted it, took it over there, and placed it exactly where they should have been, uh, where some extraordinary strength uh, of the wall was needed. <coughs> and, and this, as you could see, if you, without going back in slides, is not on, on ground level. It's in one of the higher courses. So it was quarried, cut, lifted, taken there, and put exactly in place where it belongs. And now this is on the western wall of this structure, and there are three of them, and that's exactly what you find in this archaeological tunnel in Jerusalem. Those three colossal stones are also a triliton in the western wall. So, to say, well, could be that the same engineers who could cut and lift those stones were the same, uh, maybe it is so. So, if we don't want to speculate who really built the uh, great stone platform called the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, uh, we are certainly allowed to uh, uh, speculate who, who built this one. And uh, by the way, uh, <coughs> this is an illustration of a, um, a <coughs> spacecraft uh, launched by the Chinese. Now we are used to seeing uh, uh, our spacecraft, the shuttlecraft, launched from uh, uh, Cape Canaveral, uh, from, from a steel structure that uh, is wheeled and then it's removed and uh, the Ch Chinese built it all of stone. And after I saw that picture, I realized <coughs> what Baalbek was. Baalbek was a launch site built of stone. And because this goes deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, and that indeed there was once a rocket ship standing there. Uh, we find depicted in a Phoenician um, a coin uh, from Lebanon depicting the uh, depicting Baalbek in those days and clearly showing a uh, rocket ship unless it's a very large pencil uh, standing on a platform and you see the, the, the retaining wall and, and all that so uh, <coughs> Uh, we have uh, the story of the Sumerian king Gilgamesh, you must all be familiar with it by now, uh, who around uh, 2900 BC or 2800 BC, uh, the, 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 the date is in some uh, dispute on how you calculate, uh, <coughs> was uh, uh, the, the son of a goddess, his mother was a goddess, and because uh, not his father, but his mother was a goddess, uh, he was not just a demigod, half a god, he was two-thirds uh, divine, according to his own uh, epic tale. And um, he came to his mother, uh, the goddess Ninsun, and said to her, <coughs> if I'm two-thirds divine, uh, why should I die as a mortal and should not have uh, the longevity of, uh, of the gods? And she told him, uh, well, uh, you, you have a point here, uh, but in order to attain our longevity, uh, you have to go uh, to uh, the planet from which we came, uh, because that is uh, why we have the longevity, because of its uh, orbital period. Uh, which is much longer, actually 3,600 times longer uh, than the one on Earth. Uh, 
Uh, so he went, he went in search of uh, a place from which he could be taken aloft uh, to join the gods on their planet. And uh, one of the places uh, was uh, Baalbek, uh, which uh, uh, is called in the text the landing place. And there is a section in the Epic of Gilgamesh where he describes that uh, uh, when he and his uh, uh, helper <coughs> uh, reached the, 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 the place in the cedar forest, which is uh, the only one, uh, the only cedar forest known as one in Lebanon, in where Baalbek is. <coughs> uh, so during the night when they uh, encamped before trying to enter, uh, the cedar forest and reach the place, he actually saw a uh, rocket ship being launched. And this is a quote from, uh, uh, from the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, written almost uh, uh, 4,500 years ago. And uh, <clears throat> it says, uh, the vision that I saw was wholly awesome. The heavens shrieked, the earth boomed, though daylight was dawning, darkness came, lightning flashed, a flame shot up, the clouds swelled, it rained death, then the glow vanished, the fire went out, and all that had fallen was turned to ashes. Mm -hmm. And that's from the Epic of Gilgamesh, of what he saw at the place that the text names is the landing place. <coughs> now, <coughs> uh, we come uh, to perhaps the most unexpected part of my talk, if anybody was wondering ahead of time what I will say. Uh, <coughs> uh, if you have read my books before, uh, if you have uh, had my talks before, <coughs> you may recall <coughs> that uh, in answer to the question, how did I become uh, involved, interested uh, in the subject? And I sometimes tell that it all started when I was a schoolboy, uh, let's say around 10 years old, 10, 11. And uh, <coughs> we were studying the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, in its original uh, Hebrew language. And we reached chapter 6 of Genesis, uh, which is the chapter that uh, says that, uh, and maybe I'll read it, so uh, uh, there should be no misunderstanding here, what I'm talking about. And it says, uh, now this is uh, the King James uh, translation, the standard King James translation. <laughs> and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. <laughs> that the sons of God, in the Hebrew it says the sons of Elohim, uh, which uh, is a plural word, uh, this is what here it says a singular God, uh, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, uh, in the Hebrew, Again, it says that they were compatible. <coughs> and they took them as wives of all which they chose. And the Lord, which in the Hebrew Bible says Yahweh, said, my spirit shall not always strive with men, and that's why he decided to um, bring the deluge about. And then <coughs> these verses go on to say, there were giants, in the earth, or other translation says upon the earth, in those days, and also after that, after the deluge, when the sons of God, the sons of Elohim, in the plural, came in unto the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, and the same, and they became the mighty men, the mighty men, uh, which were of old men of renown. In Hebrew, the term uses giborim, mighty men. And these, of course, were the demigods, because the children 
uh, born uh, to uh, gods, the sons of the gods, and the daughters of men, whereby the Phoenician demigods. And it so happens that in other books, not in the, the canonized Bible, but in the books uh, um, that are extra biblical books, like the book of Jubilees, the book of Enoch and others, uh, the place where this event, that the sons of the gods came down and seeing the daughters of men took them as wife, the place is named, and that is Baalbek. So now we have a platform much larger than the one in Jerusalem, but in many ways similar, that directly links it to events described in the Bible and in much greater detail in the Sumerian text on which these tales are based. And if you also recall my uh, uh, youth day story, is uh, uh, my whole interest in the subject came because when we came to this word, he written, there were giants upon the earth. I raised my hand and said, uh, excuse me, uh, my teacher, but why do you explain the word as giants when the word is in Hebrew, is Nephilim, Nephilim, which literally means those who have come down, those who have descended, the so-called fallen gods in, in Sunday preachings. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I was expecting uh, to be uh, uh, complimented by the teacher. I thought he'd say something very good, very good, Sitchin, you know your Hebrew. And instead he reprimanded me very harshly uh, because he said, uh, you don't question the Bible, uh, which I was not doing. I was, on the contrary, trying to point out the need to accurately understand the meaning of the Hebrew terminology. <laughs> so uh, here we have a direct link uh, between uh, Baalbek and the smaller platform in Jerusalem uh, with this whole tale uh, of the demigods uh, of whom, as I said, Gilgamesh was one, except that uh, his mother being a, <coughs> a goddess, not the father a god, but the mother goddess, he was two-thirds and not one-third uh, divine. <coughs> Uh, in, uh, in modern terminology, uh, what does it mean uh, that he was a demigod or that he was uh, two-thirds divine? And that, uh, that means that um, uh, his DNA was somehow different. Uh, if his, only his father would have been a god, and then so much of his uh, DNA in his genome uh, would be one way, but since the mother from whom uh, a second kind of DNA called mitochondrial DNA is also passed from generation to generation, so since his mother was a goddess, um, uh, he was two-thirds, two-thirds uh, like her genetically and not only one hair. <coughs> now, uh, I thought that I'll surprise some of you uh, all of you, <laughs> with the news that a new book uh, of mine is uh, coming out. Uh, I, uh, <coughs> I myself had a, a surprise when some told me today that they already have the book. It was not supposed to be out uh, before the 18th, and today I think is only the 16th. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, so this book deals directly with that issue of uh, gods, uh, demigods, and, uh, and says, and that is uh, if the last, in the last chapter, uh, if people will have the patience to read chapter after chapter in the order in which I wrote them, and that is that um, 
uh, I claim in this book, and I think I proved the claim, that uh, uh, two skeletal remains uh, uncovered in some uh, um, excavations in Sumer some 80 years ago uh, and are deemed to be those of a queen and a prince are actually of a goddess and a demigod and uh, though everyone including me assumed that uh, th those uh, remains were found and uh, 80 years ago and discarded uh, that they were still uh, kept and they are in the basement of a an important museum <coughs> with whom I've been in touch uh, and uh, uh, until now has refused to do a DNA comparison uh, with our DNA <coughs> because um, if a comparison is made uh, and if it's uh, uh, discovered uh, that the DNA, especially of the female, uh, who I claim is a goddess, uh, directly linked uh, with uh, genomically uh, with the gods who came from Nibiru, uh, then uh, I'm revolutionizing uh, science, religion, <laughs> archaeology, uh, uh, the, all, all the other <coughs> scholars can make a big bonfire of their books. <laughs> and um, so, so those who possess the, the, the remains uh, <coughs> are not eager uh, to do the testing. Um, the, the, the publisher uh, is thinking of launching uh, a petition by readers of my books who would uh, uh, sign a petition to the particular museum uh, requesting, demanding that the test be made. So we'll see what comes out of that. <coughs> but anyway, uh, so this is a direct link also uh, to the whole story of Gilgamesh and, um, and Baalbek and the DNA and chapter 6 of Genesis and the platform in Jerusalem. <coughs> now, how do we know uh, this whole part that I've told you about, uh, that uh, uh, the gods, <coughs> the gods of, of a so-called mythology were actually uh, uh, physical beings, that they came from another planet, that they were here, that they did this, that they did that, uh, we know that because of the Sumerians. Um, the Sumerians who are uh, the people credited with the first known civilization in what is now, now southern Iraq. Uh, that, that's how they looked. And uh, they, they were the first to give us the will and, 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 and commerce and transportation. Um, they, they built high-rise buildings called ziggurats uh, the, with the use of bricks. They were the first uh, to use bricks. Uh, they were the first to uh, uh, invent writing. Uh, and this is a simple, simple tablet uh, recording uh, some inventory because these are numbers, the first ones are numbers but uh, from which there evolved uh, long texts and epic tales and, and lullabies and uh, so on, a whole, a whole, a whole literature, literally tens of thousands of tablets, inscribed tablets have been discovered. And they were the first to develop the cylinder seal, which uh, by taking a um, stone or most, most often a semi-precious stone <coughs> and carving it in reverse and then rolling it on, uh, rolling it on, uh, on clay, wet clay, the positive image would come out uh, like uh, the rotary presses these days. And uh, 
a permanent image uh, would remain of whatever they want to tell us. Uh, this one, by the way, happens to have the sign of the cross, uh, which I will mention in a minute too. Uh, they had music, musical instruments, uh, uh, musical notes were found uh, that, that, that can be played even to this day. <clears throat> and uh, the most amazing part, perhaps, was their knowledge of astronomy. Uh, th th this is depiction of uh, the tale of how agriculture, <clears throat> uh, the plow, <clears throat> was granted by the god of agriculture to mankind. It, it contains here a depiction of a solar system, uh, which is an amazing one. It's a cylinder seal that readers of my books uh, by the thousand have gone to Berlin uh, to, to see it. I think uh, we have people here uh, who have done that. <clears throat> and uh, this is what it depicts, a solar system, complete solar system, with the sun in the center. Uh, if you compare it <clears throat> to what we know about our solar system, not by <clears throat> stretching the planets, but as if they orbit the sun, you see that between Mars and Jupiter, uh, there is one more so-called unknown, unknown planet, <coughs> which uh, the Sumerian text called Nibiru. Uh, <coughs> there is a long seven tablet um, text known as Enuma Elish, or the Epic of Creation which says how this planet happened to become a member of our solar system and the dealing with its uh, great elliptical orbit <clears throat> that brings it back to our vicinity every 3,600 years. Uh, whenever, <clears throat> whenever that planet uh, returns to our vicinity and becomes visible again, uh, its usual uh, symbol, which is a winged disc, becomes the symbol of the cross. And uh, I thought that, uh, uh, in particular, uh, <coughs> this afternoon, it's important to mention <coughs> the origin of the symbol of the cross uh, preceding the, the time of Jesus. <clears throat> now, uh, we know much of um, uh, what the Sumerians have uh, uh, written down to, to tell us. By a certain tablet, uh, it's actually not a flat tablet, it's called a prism. It's in the museum, Ashmolean Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. It is known as object number WB444. And it tells the story of how civilization on Earth began. Uh, the term used uh, <coughs> for civilization is Nam Lugal, and it says, or translated sometimes kingship, and it says that kingship was lowered from heaven. And at least all the kings, ten of them, uh, rulers from Nibiru, uh, who uh, reigned here uh, for uh, 432,000 years, the, our years, which is only 120 of theirs in total, uh, who reigned here until the deluge. So this is uh, a document that mentions the, the, the deluge uh, for the first time, long before it's mentioned in the Bible. And then it says that after the deluge, kingship was lowered again from heaven. And uh, I, and, and this is, is close-ups of the, of the dates and other information <coughs> given in the tablet. Um, <coughs> how did those people who came from Nibiru, uh, the so-called ancient gods, look? Uh, according to the Bible, uh, when the Elohim uh, which is the equivalent of the Biblical Nephilim, the Biblical uh, and <coughs> Sumerian Anunnaki, the Biblical Anakim, 
uh, when they decided to upgrade the hominid that they discovered on Earth uh, by adding some of their genes uh, to make the hominid uh, into a homo sapien, let's say, uh, <coughs> they said, let us, let us fashion the Adam in our image and after our likeness, both internally and externally. Uh, so therefore, when sometimes people ask me, how did they look? Uh, do, did they look like us? I say, no, we look like them, <laughs> because that's how they made us. So here's how two of their males looked. Uh, here's how one of their females looked. And you see here she's dressed with some flying gear of an astronaut. Uh, and, and that, 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 this is an image from a cylinder seal that, that, that I chose to show you because it shows one of them based on Mars, uh, greeting one who is based on Earth uh, with a spacecraft uh, between them. And somebody corrected me and said, this is not a spacecraft, uh, this is a communication spacecraft uh, because it has antennas. If you see the difference in terminology, I don't. It's a spacecraft between the two planets. And this is from 2500 BC. And this is in the Hermitage Museum in uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> because those who were stationed on Mars, uh, when they came to Earth, uh, had their base at Baalbek. Uh, so this is one of the guys uh, who came and saw the daughters of men and uh, that they were compatible and had children by them. And this is a scene depicting how the gods and actually a goddess, uh, we were not created by a god, we were created by a goddess named Ninharsak, so all the ladies in the audience can take credit. <laughs> and uh, the stories in the Bible, also in Siberian texts, about some chosen individuals, and uh, this one is Hanoch, Enoch, uh, who were um, taken up to visit uh, the, the Nibiru. There are uh, <coughs> Sumerian tales about Adapa, and Meduran Ki and others, so um, some, some were privileged to be taken aloft, as Gilgamesh wanted uh, to be taken unsuccessfully for him. And uh, <coughs> uh, this is uh, scenes depicting how the symbols of kingship uh, were uh, granted to kings. And, and here we come to uh, uh, the question, why is Jerusalem important? <clears throat> According to all the information that I called from the tablets, is that <clears throat> when they uh, started to settle here and uh, put into full operation uh, the reason they came here, which was the need for gold, with which to protect the atmosphere on their own planet. <coughs> and they uh, uh, built a spaceport. Uh, they built a mission control center, uh, the term for which in Sumerian was Duranki, the place of the bond heaven and earth. It also sometimes was referred as the naval, the naval place because all the other places were equidistant from it and it, so it was in the center and the layout was such that a landing corridor, landing and takeoff, but the landing corridor was formed like that with the mission control center here and the space for there. Now all that was wiped out by the deluge. After the deluge, a new layout had to be created. 
It could not be done there anymore because it was covered with millions of tons of, uh, of mud. So this one was the layout of the landing corridor after the deluge, according to my conclusions. And it again was anchored on the two most prominent peaks in the Middle East, the twin peaks of Ararat. It had to pass through and include the landing plot platform, which, if you recall, the old tale of the giants on Nephilim over here, before the deluge and after the deluge, which means that the platform had to exist even before the deluge, and it remained, so it was included in the layout. Twin peaks were formed here where there were no mountains, which is the two great pyramids in Giza. <clears throat> and equidistant from there and from there was chosen the point to serve as mission control center, as a new navel of the earth, as a new Duran key. So when you complete this whole layout and you see that this place eventually known as Jerusalem is equidistant, is in the center, and is e exactly the same form, the same triangles and the same landing pattern as the previous one. <coughs> you now understand why Jerusalem is where it is. It was not intended as a settlement for people. Uh, the platform built there, smaller than the one in Baalbek, was to serve as one of the key points in the contacts, in the relationship, in the bond between heaven and earth. And <clears throat> here is a quote from the book of Ezekiel about why Jerusalem is where it is. And it's, the Lord says, thus has said the Lord Yahweh, this is Jerusalem. In the midst of the nations I placed her, and all the lands are in a circle round about her. Now what could be more explicit than to explain this design? So this is why Jerusalem is where it is, the, in a place that is no water, and there's no rivers, and there's no roads, and there's nothing. So the two peaks in Giza, the two artificial mountains, were uh, emptied, especially the Great Pyramid, was emptied of its uh, guidance equipment when uh, his, the rivalries between the Anunnaki clans, I call them in my book, the wars of gods and men, the pyramid wars, uh, the, the equipment was removed. Uh, in the Sinai Peninsula uh, was the spaceport, and this is an Egyptian depiction of the uh, silo that was there. <laughs> but, uh, and that's by the way the two places where Gilgamesh went to, uh, Baalbek and the spaceport. And, but the spaceport, that's again, uh, very few people know even after I wrote about it in my book that there's an actual tablet, Sumerian tablet mentioning Abraham, but that's a story in itself. Okay, so uh, uh, there is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, which again in the, in the Sumerian text is explained in greater detail in especially something called the Era Epic uh, that uh, in the end in the rivalries between the various Anunnaki clans nuclear weapons were used uh, to wipe out the spaceport leaving a, a great crater uh, and a break in the peninsula to this day 
And to this day, if you visit it, as uh, I and people with me were, you see in the midst of pure white limestone mountains, there is this whole area with <coughs> barren through, uh, broken up, um, gravel-like rocks, uh, totally barren through and blackened to this day. And uh, uh, this is uh, the sum total of it. Uh, there were four places that served as links uh, between Earth and Nibiru, between us and Anunnaki. Uh, the post-deluvial spaceport, uh, Giza, Baalbek, and Jerusalem. So Giza was emptied of its equipment in the Pyramid Wars. This one was destroyed in the nuclear uh, holocaust. And this is in ruins from uh, Greek and Roman times. And the only one that is left as a portal uh, is Jerusalem. Um, what would happen to Jerusalem? And all the prophecies about the end of days, <coughs> uh, I think I have to, I, I'll, I'll skip it. But anyway, there is a prophecy of, in, in Ezekiel about the final war uh, of Gog, Gog of Magog. And uh, the thing that, that uh, makes, makes me feel like a chill in my spine and when I read that prophecy, is because he says, of all the nations that will join in that final war to attack what is today the land of Israel, the first one that is listed in Ezekiel is Persia, which is today's Iran. And uh, uh, I will not put on the lights to read it uh, because. Uh, I've speak, spoken long enough, but, uh, uh, and, and I wonder, I told it uh, earlier today, I wonder whether uh, my parents named me Zechariah uh, for, just because they liked the name or because of some uh, uh, profound reason which they themselves didn't know, uh, because the most specific, the most specific prophecy in the whole Bible, uh, Old and New Testament included, and with all the, the prophecies about Armageddon and all that in this, that says that God, Yahweh says, I will return, I will return and make Jerusalem where the seat, royal seat of, of David shall be established by his descendants. I will return and make Zion again a center for the nations. And that is in the prophecies of Zechariah. So um, if after <laughs> this long talk you want, I can still show you exactly where in Zechariah. So, uh, uh, when we talk about Armageddon, uh, one has to uh, realize that it's really a, a name of a place in Israel. It comes uh, a distortion of Har Megiddo, the Mount of Megiddo, which was a strategic place from time immemorial. And um, uh, in my book, The End of Days, which preceded the one I, I showed you. In that book, I say that um, uh, the, the prophecies that the, the Bible are called the end of days, uh, which are not the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is the return of the planet. The return of the planet itself is not, I'm stressing, not imminent. 
and therefore I am really chagrined when I see articles and movies and these that, that really frighten people that it, it, it's the end and, and, and monsters are coming to, to, to use us as food or, or, or whatever. And I say, please, please, please stop, stop the nonsense. Uh, the, the ones who will come, not on the day of the Lord, not the planet, but who will come at what the Bible calls the, day, the end of days, the end of days when there will be finally a return, but preceded, preceded by, by great trials and tribulations will happen, I uh, say so in my book, The End of Days, I uh, stuck my neck out and, and I still stand by it, will be happen this century, this century, because this century is still the century, the last century of the age of Pisces. And this is when the return will take place. And it is probably again no coincidence that in excavations very recently uh, near Megiddo, at the foot of Mount Megiddo, the first the remains of the first Christian church in, in, in the land of Israel after the life and death of, of, of Jesus, <laughs> the remains were found at the foot of uh, Mount Megiddo. And there a, a, a beautiful mosaic floor was discovered. And what is the design on that floor? Pisces, Pisces, the age of Pisces. So these are the uh, predictions and prophecies of Zechariah. Thank you.